Okay, <clears throat> so we are going live now. Just get on this page. Okay, now I should be able to see. Um, it's on a bit of a delay, but I will be able to see um, how many people are watching. Like we already have two people signed on right now, and then I'll also be able to monitor the comments so that people can react and tell us. So if you are on right now, please let us know if the audio and video and everything is going well in the comments. Just want to make sure it goes well this time. <laughs> okay. We will give people another minute to just hop on. Okay, well, we have three people right now and Steve is on. So hi, Steve. Um, so uh, I will um, do a quick introduction. Um, my name is Natalie and I am the marketing manager and social media and public relations with Wild Blue Press. And I am here with Patrick Gallagher tonight. Thank you again, Patrick, for joining me a second time. Um, You're welcome. The, the first interview went really well for us um, between the two of us, but nobody else could watch it. So um, we are redoing it. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the comments at any time. We can get those so Patrick can answer whatever you guys want to hear him talk about. Um, and I guess we will start with a reading again from your book, uh, Till Death Do Us. I thought I would read the first chapter. Perfect. May 19th, 1927. Who knows the heart of a young woman? Does even she know what motivates her? What drives her passions? What desires and fears compete within her? Gladys Rouse, 20 years old and living in Minidoka, Idaho, which at the time of her marriage boasted a whopping citizenry of 200 souls, was beautiful and headstrong. She thought she knew her mind. She was sure she was ready to step out from under the wings of her parents, William and Anna. The middler of five children, Gladys was also the only girl. She really loved her brothers and they doted over her as well. Okay. So Professionally this nicknamed fun. Flea by the brothers, they were always there for her whenever she got into trouble. And that she did in abundance. As was typical in faithful Mormon families, they all had strong family feelings and each of the boys married well and for life. That's why it's so strange that Gladys did not fit the mold. Where they were strong, she was weak. They made their faith a central part of their everyday lives. Gladys used her LDS connections as a tool to achieve her goals. She lived within the circle of Mormonism, but it was never a significant influence in her decision-making. What did influence the decision-making of Gladys Rouse? Jesse was the oldest and three years older. Eugene was two years older and 
carried the nickname Red. Sterling Anthony, who went by Tony, was two years younger. And the baby of the family, Clifford, was called Bud or Buddy by everybody. A great family, but a tragedy in the making. For Gladys was always a worry, always in crisis. Was it something the family did wrong in the way they raised Gladys? Was it some inherited flaw that came down from some unknown ancient ancestor? Perhaps just raising a daughter is way different than bringing up those rowdy boys and her parents missed the difference. The folks certainly loved Gladys just as much as the boys, perhaps even more because she was the only girl. And maybe that was part of the problem. Possibly some of the problem was the way they always bailed her out whenever a situation arose. Somewhere the notion that a person learns from the consequences they encounter is negated when the consequences don't really touch them. Can it be that a shielded life is actually great harm to the child and her proper development? When parents are trying their best to do what is right, sometimes they bend over backwards too far and they actually create the very evil they're trying to overcome. Gladys June Ralphs married William Basil Hendricks on May 19th of 1927, a few weeks before her 21st birthday. Gladys did not have a middle name according to her birth certificate, but she felt that a middle name sounded more auspicious and June struck her as a good one, short and easy to pronounce it added a certain dignity and refinement to her given name. Of course, she became Gladys Hendricks when she married William, but unfortunately, the marriage didn't last, nor did the name. After she and William divorced, less than a year after their wedding day, Gladys reverted to her maiden name. That's chapter one. Thank you. Okay, so I just want to remind everyone that um, we are taking audience questions. If you have a question, please enter it in the comments. Um, otherwise, I have prepared some questions just to kind of keep us going. So um, I will ask those now. So um, to start with, um, I mean, I know how you uh, got involved in this story, but can you tell everyone kind of what drew you to this story? How did the idea strike you? Um, how did you, you come to this uh, premise for the book? Well, Natalie, this story is really part of my heritage. It's, it's a story in my family. My grandfather was the lead defense attorney for Gladys when she was on trial for murder. The trial occurred in 1947, early in the year. I was born late in that same year. So all my life, I've heard the story of how granddad represented this woman in her murder trial. And it was one of the most famous murder trials in Eastern Oregon, in fact, in all of Oregon at that time. And in fact, the story had nationwide uh, prominence I found articles in newspapers from back in 1947 at the time of the trial from Boston and Phoenix and Spokane, Washington. So uh, it was a, a nationwide story that people were following. Yeah, I mean, definitely a big human interest story for sure. So, um... So how did you get involved? Can you tell everyone about finding the letters and kind of how you had the idea? Um, did you know it was gonna be you immediately to write the story or did you kind of you know, think maybe there's someone who is an experienced author who could do this or was it always you? Well, to start with, uh, what really motivated me to write this, I, I am not an author professionally, this is, the first time I've ever written a book. Well, you first are time now. I've tried to write a book. <laughs> uh, and so 
I never dreamed of growing up to be an author, but when my father died in 1980, that's 40 years ago, I inherited a family trunk, which was kind of half of a steamer trunk that he had inherited from his parents, my grandparents. And um, that trunk included a lot of family memorabilia, photos of my dad and his siblings when they were children, letters that my grandfather had written when he was away from uh, home on business, and uh, just a lot of the same kind of family stuff we all have. But buried at the bottom of that trunk, I found a cardboard box decorated with poinsettia flowers that included a stack of love letters written by Dr. Broadhurst, who's the victim in this, this event, to his wife, Gladys, who was ultimately my grandfather's client. Those love letters never saw the light of day during the trial. And um, they've been buried in that trunk. Now it's 73 years. And, uh, and it seemed to me that the story behind those letters that led to the whole story of the whole uh, murder and trial needed to be told. And so I did wonder how that should happen. And I did even have thoughts of handing them over to a professional writer. But ultimately I, I thought it would be fun to try and do it myself. And I had no idea if I would ever successfully complete a book, but uh, I did take a stab at it. And uh, over the course of four years, off and on, I, I managed to write this book. To start with though, I had to do a whole lot of research because I knew very little about the trial other than the fact that my grandfather was her attorney. What were the best sources for you and how did you come across that research? I mean, I'm assuming a lot of things haven't been archived into the internet from 1947. So how did you come across the sources? Well, Natalie, it's surprising what you can find from 1947 and earlier. Uh, with some great help, uh, we were able to unearth the whole history of Gladys and her multiple marriages. And uh, on the internet, we were able to find who she married, the date of the marriage, and I was able to create uh, the whole framework for her life. But still, that was just that framework. Um, I needed specific details of the crime and of the trial. And, and I knew that the best source for that would be the transcript of the trial proceedings. But I didn't know where to find them. And, and again, my research turned into kind of a, kind of a scavenger hunt. Uh, I talked to the county clerk who helped me look and she couldn't find them. And she referred me to another government official and she couldn't find them. And I went to three or four people before finally I was able to learn where the trial transcript was being kept. And, and then I had to learn how to gain access to them because mm -hmm. you can't just walk in there and ask for them. And, um, but when I did gain access to them, I wanted to get copies of them and they wouldn't let me take them. They wouldn't let me run down to Kinko's and get copies <laughs> made, but they did have a photocopier in that room uh, with my credit card. I was able to uh, photocopy all 1,232 pages, I think it is, of that trial transcript. Took me most of a day in that room copying these pages, but I found yeah. them. So that was my second great source of information. Uh, well, really the third, the internet, the letters, and the trial transcript. But there's still more information that I wanted, more of how everybody was reacting to the story. And, and when I searched online for old newspaper articles, as I mentioned, I found a few, three or four, that uh, was, like I say, from Boston and Phoenix and um, Spokane, Washington, but not much. My wife and I took a trip to Jordan Valley, Oregon, which is the town was kind of the center of this, this story in a way. The murder occurred just outside of Jordan Valley. Today, Jordan Valley has a population of 175 people. 
it was some bigger back then, but it, it still has always been a very small town, but it has a museum and, and it's kind of a museum on demand. Uh, the lady, uh, Joanne Cunningham, who's the um, director of that museum, she has a sign posted on the museum door that says, if you'd like to look in our museum, give me a call. So I called her up, <laughs> she drove over, she opened up the museum and uh, my wife and I spent uh, the better part of a day of an afternoon in the museum. She, the museum had multiple three ring binders that where somebody who was involved with the museum 73 years ago had cut out every newspaper article they could get about this murder trial and glued them into this, uh, these binders. So uh, we used our camera phones, the cameras on our phones, and, and I got tons of newspaper articles uh, that pertain to this trial. So that was my fourth really huge source. Those four together gave me what I needed to be able to put the story in chronological order and then create the story itself. So one thing a lot of people are interested in is like the writing process and kind of, you know, writer's quirks. So if there was like a snack or a drink that kept you going, if you had like had to be by the window where you write best outside. Um, so just tell us a little bit about your kind of unique writing style and what that process and journey was like for you. Well, a couple of things I can say about that. First is that uh, I did create kind of my little man cave down in the basement. We have a finished basement and, and I had a, a computer down there, a laptop, and I've got all the trial transcripts and all the documents that I had amassed over the four years of research. And, and so um, I learned that it takes a discipline. You know, writing the book wasn't terribly difficult because, I mean, it was not simple, but it was kind of easy in one sense that I had a chronological rec uh, recreating of the timeline of Gladys's life and her marriages and um, the events surrounding the murder and the murder trial itself and the events following. And so, so that, was, that was nice that I, I had the chronology and I just had to mm -hmm. put the meat on the bones of that. But, but the key was I had to be consistent. And, and I got discouraged a few times, no question about that. I got involved in a construction project and that took me away from it for quite a while, but, but I found that I just, I just had to be diligent about putting in my, usually it was three or four hours a day writing. And, and I had a couple authors that I had contacted because I had some questions and they, they were very encouraging and uh, told me they thought I had a good story, told me they thought it was worth publishing. And somebody who was a professional that uh, gave me that kind of encouragement, that really mattered a lot. And I really appreciated that. So we have our first question from the audience. Um, Lori wants to know any memories you have of your grandfather talking about this trial or anything that people have told you about your grandfather talking about the trial? I was only in the second grade when my grandfather died. So my memories of him are pretty meager. I, don't, I have some memories of him, but not in connection with the trial. Um, I, I do remember the family talking about the trial, just in mm -hmm. general, about how the trial went and what kind of the, some of the results of the trial were. Um, but, you know, I do remember my grandfather, but not in connection with the trial. Okay. And just a reminder, if anyone else has questions, please put them in the comments. Um, we will get them over and get those answered as well. Otherwise, I have a whole <laughs> list of questions. Um, so I guess next, one thing that I think is really interesting from being kind of behind the scenes on books in my job, um, and I'm wondering how it is for you as an author when it's your own book, is 
the title selection and also the cover design. So can you tell us a little bit about those? Did you go in with, you know, some kind of mock title or did you just go in with, I don't know what to call this or kind of what was the process like? Well, here's where my publisher, Wild Blue Press, played a huge role. Uh, I actually have had three titles to the book. Uh, I started with one title, which I didn't really like very well, and came up with my own title, which I liked because it spoke to me. But the publisher had a much better title that they recommended to me. And it, it was a kind of title that makes, makes a book much more appealing and understandable to a casual looker who's just saying, you know, is this a book I might be interested in? So um, the title was was from the publisher. They recommended it, and I immediately recognized what a good idea that was. And the, the cover is kind of the same thing. I'm no cover designer, but I went down to the local bookstore and I looked at a bunch of books to see how you know how they were printed and how how they designed their covers. And I came up with a cover design, but it was very simple. My publisher came up with the current uh, cover, which I think is beautiful. I just really appreciate the work they did creating that yeah. cover. It, I really like the cover and uh, it, it jumps out at you. It's got a photo of Gladys right on the front. Mm -hmm. It's got several headlines from news, newspapers that I got out of the Jordan Valley Museum and uh, they put that on there. So um, their assistance was huge. Yeah, it definitely is a really nice cover. It, it gives a really good feel for what the book is going to be about, I think. Um, a question for me, do publishers often change the title and are they recommendations or is the final decision made by the publisher? Um, I work mostly on the back end with the books, so I see the cover or the title choices and the cover choices. Um, and we have kind of a small team at Wild Blue Press. So usually um, we'll see, you know, here are the three or four choices. Um, and I don't know if that includes the author's recommendations and the publisher's recommendations. I don't know who comes up with those, um, but I usually do see three or four choices for covers and titles. Um, and sometimes we actually can't decide on a title. We all think, you know, different ones are good and we have a contest and just let um, our fans pick the title that they think best represents kind of what the book is about. Um, I don't remember seeing different titles for your book, but I do remember seeing different covers. And I definitely think that the one that um, was ultimately chosen was the best one. Like I said, I think it really um, gives a little bit, uh, you know, about the book just from looking at it. I, I agree. And I'll just add a little bit to that. When, when Wild Blue Press uh, suggested a new title to me, um, I got the impression, and the same thing goes for the cover, when they suggested the cover to me, I got the impression that it was ultimately their decision and they were asking for my input. Uh, but in both cases, my choice agreed with their choice. So <laughs> Which is ideal. I don't know quite what would happen if, if I said, oh no, I like this one and they, and they didn't like it. Uh, <laughs> I think that the publisher would be the final decision maker there, but fortunately, we all agreed. Yeah. And that's how you know it really is the best choices when yeah. everyone kind of takes a look at it and decides that that's right. Yeah. Um, Steve might write in some more about that. He also works at Wild Blue Press for anyone who's watching. Um, okay. So uh, you wrote a blog post, and I know you mentioned it earlier in this interview that the letters were not entered into evidence in the trial. They were lost before the trial. Um, do you think the trial would have gone any differently if the letters had been entered into evidence or how do you think they would have impacted the trial if at all? I actually believe, and this is my conjecture, but I actually believe that had those letters been presented at the trial, they would have had a large impact on the final uh, sentencing of the of the defendant. Um, 
I, I don't think they would have changed what the guilty or not guilty verdict was, but I think that they very well may have changed what the ultimate decision was on sentencing. So Steve put his input in about the titles. He says, we often go with what the author chooses. However, sometimes authors are so close to the book that they might not understand kind of, they're like too close to see what everyone else is going to be able to see about the book um, for people who don't know anything about it. So um, the publisher has the final word he says, which specifically is for a while blue press, I'm sure it's similar to other presses. Um, but yeah, he says, like I said, if we have a disagreement, we'll just see what our readers think. And um, we have changed our opinion for some titles, depending on the results of what the readers think. And ultimately that's, you know, what we want is what's gonna be the most influential for the readers and what's going to get them the best message for the book so um, certainly in my case having no experience with publishing uh, i'm i was totally prepared to go with whatever the publisher <laughs> decided okay well i'm glad it worked out i think it's a good title and i think it's a good cover as well I might be a little biased, but. <laughs> um, Me too. Which person from the book would you most like to spend time with? I mean, obviously um, your grandfather is in the story, but apart from him, who would you most like to spend time with if you could go, go back and do that? I'd love to spend time with the, the victim here. Um, yeah. I find that this book is less about the murder and less about uh, the trial, although the murder and the trial are definitely included in it and critical to it. But the real thrust of the book, at least my goal was to try to understand Gladys and how she acted and why she acted the way she did, why she made the decisions she did. Uh, she's a very complex person and, and very, difficult to fathom what her motives are. But at the same time, I think the same thing can be said about the, about the, the victim here. You know, Dr. Broadhurst, who was married to Gladys uh, and ultimately was murdered, um, he seemed so intent on accepting her bizarre behavior. He seemed so intent on always um, excusing what is really unacceptable behavior. Uh, he, he, he just refused to see the bad side of her. And why, you know, why, why did he act that way? Was it because he was afraid of losing her? Was it because he was kind of a weak guy? I don't, I, I don't see that because he was a very successful uh, chiropractor and he owned two large uh, ranches. He was very successful financially. So I don't see him as just a weak-minded person, but I'd sure like to spend time with him and get to know him. He seemed like a really nice guy. Yeah. But why did he act the way he did? I think it's a good question. Yeah, I agree. He definitely, from reading the book, he just seems like the kind of guy that everyone in town would just be like, he's so nice. And yeah, yeah, so he definitely seems interesting. I personally would love to spend time with Gladys and just get her like internal, you know, opinion on, on why she did the things that she did because she's just ridiculous from reading the book. I, it's weird to read her letters and know that everything she's saying to him is a lie and you're like, but why is he believing it? And he just he writes so eloquently to her and he loves her so much. So I definitely agree with you. I definitely want to know how she can just lie bold faced like that. And, and also, you know, why he chose to accept her behavior when he probably could have been, you know, told that she was lying. So yeah. definitely. Yeah. Wish we could go back and 
know what they were thinking, but. It would be nice. Can I add one more thing that's kind of a little side note here? Yeah, um, of course. I always have assumed that everybody connected with this trial is dead. And, uh, you know, the trial occurred 73 years ago. So anybody that was an adult back in those days, surely is no longer living. But I actually, since the book was published, I was contacted by a woman who was actually a witness in the trial. Wow. And uh, she was 15 years old when she testified in the trial. She's 88 now. Uh, but she also had been a patient of the doctors. She and her mom both had on at least one occasion, maybe more than one, gone to Dr. Broadhurst's office and been treated by him in his chiropractic practice. So I'm just, I, I just loved speaking with her and talking to her and, uh, and she's sharp as a tack. And it was really a fun experience. That is, that's incredible that, you know, she found the book and, and reached out. Do you know how she found out about the book? Was she just keeping an eye I, on the trial or? No, I do. Um, she lives in my hometown of Ontario, Oregon. And she lives in an assisted living home there. And I was back in Ontario oh, about a month ago and I was interviewed by the local newspaper and they put a nice big article right on the front page about mm -hmm. my book. That's how she learned about the book okay. and she had her daughter contact me. Okay. Yeah, that's really awesome. Um, okay, so we have a question from Tim. Did you feel that the pandemic presented any challenges in your ability to research the book? Are there any topics you wanted to research further, but you didn't have like the time or the resources? Um, was it was your book mostly written when you know the pandemic started happening? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, the the book was finished before the pandemic hit. Okay. Um, and as far as whether I wanted to research more, I would have liked to, but. I didn't know where else to look. You know, I mean, if there's more information available, I would love to have included it. Like, like uh, this young lady, Virginia, who's now an older woman who is a witness in the trial. Boy, I would love to have met her before I finished writing the book so I could include that story in it. Um, um, I also met a guy, uh, he called me, who had attended the trial. He was a high school student during the trial. And he actually, one afternoon, had attended the trial. So, you know, I'd love to have met them before I finished the book, but I didn't. Um, but the pandemic uh, did not impact writing the book, but I think it does impact uh, selling the book and promoting it because, you know, I'd love to have some uh, author signing events where people yeah. can come and get a copy of the book and have me sign it. But Right now, that doesn't seem like it'll fly. Yeah, yeah, that's been a problem for uh, a lot of nonfiction authors um, from the pandemic. I know is that people are reading more because they have more time, but also authors can't go and have a massive book signing with you know thirty plus people or how many are going to show up. So that's been a, a problem across the industry. I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes true crime can be kind of heavy. Um, and after reading most of the book, it's, you know, it's not too much into the heaviness. Um, but did you ever feel a little bit bogged down by like the seriousness or the crime or anything like that? And if so, how did you like combat that? Well, uh, that's important to me because I don't like to read about a lot of blood, guts, and gore. That's not my interest. And, yeah. you know, a lot of books and movies include that, but that, that didn't interest me. So I uh, intentionally avoided that. And the same thing goes with a lot of foul language. I'm not interested in that and didn't include that in the book either. And um, so, you know, it was just a, a decision I made at the very outset. This is kind of how I'm going to approach it. Um, I do give uh, the details, the complete details of the murder, but mm -hmm. um, I don't go into any of the, the gory part. And like 
for example, in in the the box that the state had that included the trial transcript, there also were uh, a number of the exhibits that were used during the trial, and they had you know, like photos of the dead body, and I I didn't get copies of any of them because that wasn't what I was interested in. Yeah, yeah. For anyone who is a true crime reader who doesn't like very much blood and guts, I definitely would say, you know, this is this is a good introduction to true crime almost for them. Um, Cause it, yeah, it gives the details of what happened in enough detail, but it doesn't, it's not gross for, the, you know, the sake of being gross and too descriptive. So I did like that. Um, I know as a true crime reader, I'm definitely more interested in kind of like the psychosocial aspect and the relationships between, you know, the victim and the killer and, you know, everyone else. So that's definitely, um, you know, some more what this book is, is, is analyzing the relationships. So it's, no, it's, no. I loved it. It was very interesting. Well, thank you. And that was my intention. I, I definitely set out to try and write it from that aspect. Um, what was the most difficult part of the process for the book? I mean, it kind of sounds like the research, maybe. Yeah, of course, the research, doing the research was fun. I, I enjoyed it, um, but it, it was challenging because I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know where to look. And I was very fortunate to have a number of people guided me, uh, especially through the searching on the internet for all of Gladys's early history. And, uh, you know, all the help I had trying to find the trial transcript. And of course, finding the museum in Jordan Valley was, was almost a fluke. I had no idea that they had a museum there. I was in town and asking a few questions and somebody said, well, why don't you talk to Joanne Cunningham at the museum? I'm like, museum? You have a museum here. <laughs> I didn't even know they had one. So uh, that was just good luck. Yeah. Um, just a reminder, if anyone has questions or to be entered to win, Patrick will sign a copy of the book for you, paperback copy. Um, but you have to either comment or react to the video so that we know who's here. So um, just a reminder for everyone watching. Um, I guess I had this written down, but also Lori is asking, what is the best lesson that you learned from writing your first book that you can apply to your next book if you choose to do a next book? Um, and, and what kind of advice would you give to anyone who is looking to write a book or in the middle of writing a book right now? Hmm, that's a good question. I would say that uh, probably the thing I learned the most is just you know, a lot of what I've written in the book is um, copied verbatim from the letters and the trial transcripts, but I, I did create some dialogue to kind of weave it all together. And uh, I didn't feel particularly good at that. I didn't feel like that was a strong suit of mine. And so I had to work harder at trying to create the dialogue. And uh, another thing that, uh, was an interesting aspect of writing the book is the first husbands of Gladys, I knew nothing about except for their name and the date of, of uh, I think I knew the date of their birth and the date of the wedding. Mm -hmm. and, and so initially I had the idea of fictionalizing those first husbands, you know, this guy uh, beat her and that guy uh, cheated on her and, and things like that. And, and after I'd written quite a bit that way, I backed up and thought about it and I thought, you know, first of all, it's not fair to their legacy, to their memory. You know, these are men that probably married somebody else and had children and, and those children wouldn't appreciate me casting their ancestor in such a negative light when in fact there's no evidence of it whatsoever. And secondly, I felt like my goal is to write a true story. 
And so I, even though I had to add a little bit of dialogue that was you know, out of my creation, I tried to keep that to a minimum. And so I went back and I started all over again at the beginning and eliminated all that fictional part and just told what I knew. I did, from some of the facts, I did suggest a conjecture a couple of times about maybe why the marriage didn't work. Uh, mm -hmm. But I tried to put it in, couch it in a term that made it clear that I was just guessing that maybe that's what happened. Okay, we have a question from Diane. If you write another book, will it be a true crime again? Have you thought about doing another book or are you kind of taking a break after this one? Well, you know, as I said, I've been writing this book for four years. So yeah. for four years, all my friends have had to listen to me talk about it. And, <laughs> uh, and, and most of them at some point have said, well, what are you gonna write next after you're done with this one? And I've always told them, oh no, this is my one and only. I'm not writing another <laughs> book. Uh, this is hard enough all by itself. But after the book was published, well, first of all, uh, after the book was written and I tried to learn how publishing works, I did some research online about how publishing works and how to get a publisher. And that was very discouraging. Everybody wrote, yeah. be ready for rejection after rejection after rejection. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm never gonna get this book published. Fortunately, you know, I did not experience that. Wild Blue Press uh, very quickly offered to publish the book for me, which I was very grateful for. And, uh, and so uh, that process was challenging. But once it was all done and once the book was published, I cannot tell you what an exhilarating experience that was for me. I mean, I never even dreamed that I could finish a book. And I certainly never dreamed that I could get it published. And to actually have that happen is such a heady experience. I'm like, whoa, man, I wonder if I can do this again. So <laughs> I actually have been thinking about writing another book, even though I always insisted I wouldn't. Uh, but it wouldn't be a true crime book because uh, I, don't, I don't have any other true crime that's laid in my lap like this one was. <laughs> and yeah. so uh, I kind of am thinking, well, maybe I'll uh, take some of my ancestry because I do have some family stories of my great grandfather when he immigrated from Ireland and my grandfather and his brother who ran away from home when they're like 12 and 10 years old. And uh, uh it, so I'm thinking if I write a book, it might be uh, a novel using my family history as kind of a skeleton. That's what I'm thinking. Who knows if I'll get it done? <laughs> well, um, okay. Lori wants to know, do you read your own book reviews? Um, and if so, how do you balance the positive and negative comments on there? I do read my book reviews. I'm very interested in what people think. Yeah. And fortunately, most of them have been very good. Uh, one reviewer wrote that I was a terrible writer and that was a great blow to my ego. But, you know, I think I need to listen to his points. And, uh, and if I do write another book, I'll, I'll try to understand what his criticism was. But, you know, it's kind of like having someone tell you your child is ugly. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to swallow. Yeah, I can't even imagine. I love reading the reviews for the books that we publish and it's fun to see a lot of positive ones. And I like when people make fair negative comments where they're not just like, this is terrible, but they're like, I wish the book had more of this or something, you know, that's kind of constructive. So have you found any of those? Yes. Um, uh, like if you read my book, there's an author's um author's notes where I explain my relationship to my grandfather the fact that I grew up living next door to my grandparents and and uh, have wonderful fond memories of family times with my grandparents and uh, I had that at the back of the book and so to start with um, Wild Blue Press said you really need to put that at the front of the book because otherwise the book 
is less comprehensible if people don't understand your relationship to uh, P.J. Gallagher, the attorney. And that made good sense to me. So we moved it to the front of the book. But one of the criticisms was it says the book starts too late. Um, it should start one chapter earlier. And I thought what he meant was the author's note maybe should have been chapter one. And maybe he skipped the author's note and started reading chapter one. I don't know. But I thought it was a fair criticism. Okay. Yeah, that's good. I, yeah, like I said, that's my favorite is when people say things that are constructive besides just like, this is terrible. Um, <laughs> so that's definitely what I would look for if I was a writer. Um, what do you read the most? Is there a genre or author or specific authors that you like to read the most? Well, uh, for me, um, I like uh, books that have some drama in them. And, uh, and so uh, my favorite book of all time is The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. I mean, that's just a wonderful book because there's so much intrigue throughout the book from beginning to end. Uh, and maybe my second favorite book is Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky which is kind of similar. And so uh, for modern writers, I, of course, I, I like Louis L'Amour because the good guy always wins in Louis L'Amour and I like that. Um, I like yeah. John Grisham because uh, they always figure out who the bad guy is at the end. So those are the kind of books I like that have drama and, and some uh, question about how things are gonna end up. I'm not so sure I did very well about that on my book. Um, I try to, but I don't know if there's enough suspense in it. I mean, you kind of go into the book knowing that Dr. Broadhurst is, is going to die. Yeah. Um, but I think it's more about the journey. And I think, I personally think there's a lot of drama in the journey. Um, and like we were talking about earlier, kind of wondering why the characters had the perspectives that they did and, and all of that. So it kind of leaves enough room for the readers to speculate a little bit about you know what else might have been going on or what their lives might have been like before that so I don't know I feel like there's a, a good amount of drama without it just being you know like here's drama for drama's sake thank you so um do you think any of your favorite authors have influenced your writing style at all in your vocabulary or the way you I mean you laid the story out chronologically is that I don't know is there anything that you think you probably pulled from a writer? I'm sure that the books I've read have influenced how I write. I don't doubt that a bit. I can't pinpoint it. I can't tell you, oh, yes, I kind of copy this guy's style. For my next book, I think if I write the book that I'm kind of dreaming about right now, I mm -hmm. probably uh, would say that that would be similar to um, Louis L'Amour's books that are the Sackett series. And so that probably would influence me quite a bit in the next book if I write it. But for this book, it was mostly a matter of once I got the chronology determined and I used a spreadsheet and I put dates down and, and you know, move things around when I learned the dates and some things, the dates were a little ambiguous. On some of the letters, the dates were uncertain and I had to try and determine a date based on the context of the letters and where they fit in the chronology. But um, um, so I feel like this book wrote itself and to a great, great extent. And it was just my job to take all these facts and weave them into a narrative that hopefully is interesting to read. Yeah, I remember you saying that last week when we were talking about the book is that the book kind of wrote itself and I, I didn't really get what that meant until I read it and then I was like okay I can see how this would kind of write itself like it just yeah it I don't know it didn't make sense until I read it and then it, it definitely made sense um Diane wants to know in the end do you feel that justice was served for Gladys well that's a good question uh, let me tell you this to start with the public did not the public were, you know, the, the citizens in that area in Eastern Oregon were incensed at uh, how the trial ended and they were incensed later on 
uh, when things developed even further. Uh, so there was a lot of unhappiness and a lot of feeling that justice did not get served. And, and uh, especially because she was a woman, I think that's what's interesting. Because she was a woman and she was so, so vile, really, she was viewed, she, she was even viewed by the uh, uh, law officers and the district attorney as the number one culprit in this situation. And they wanted more than anything to get her convicted. And uh, so, you know, the, the public did not think justice was served. I don't think that the, uh, the legal, the lawyers uh, for the prosecution thought it was served. I don't think the law officers felt like justice was served. And after having said all that, I agree. I don't think justice was very well served. Do you think that Gladys being a woman had an impact on that? Do you, I don't know if you talk about that in the book when it comes to the trial, because um, I didn't get to that part yet. I just read to the murder. So okay. um, do you think that that has an impact and, and how do you think it would have been um, if the genders were reversed? So if you know he had killed her? Absolutely. Uh, I don't think there's any question that her gender had an impact on, on the sentencing. It's very clear that it did. Um, Lori wants to know if Hollywood has come calling yet. <laughs> no, they haven't. I've had no. a number of people say, boy, this would make a good movie. And I agree, I I'd agree. love for it to be a movie, but I know nothing about, I know less about that than I did about publishing. So, uh, <laughs> you know, if they call, I'll be glad to talk to them. Yeah, I know last week we had talked about um, I had asked you and you didn't really I think I kind of threw you when I asked um, what who would you cast in a movie if you could pick your ideal um, cast for uh, to be to be Gladys um, Lori says Sandra Bullock and Jennifer Garner I said Natalie Portman um, I, have you thought about that anymore or who would be Dr. Broadhurst or Alvin or is, is anyone else coming to mind I, I have thought about that more um, it, it's hard for me to see Sandra Bullock in this role. She's always kind of the nice guy, you know. I, I've never yeah. seen her portray anyone quite as evil as Gladys is uh, or was. Or Jennifer um, Garner. She, yeah, she's usually good too. Yeah, I, I would, I would be thrilled with any one of those. Yeah. Anyone for any of the husbands? Uh, well, for the doctor, it needs to be somebody who's big. He was a big man. So you need a, a tall, husky man, I think. And uh, uh, someone who is who can really portray caring. And, um, you know, I don't know who that would be, but uh, somebody who really demonstrates a caring nature. I don't remember who I said last week. I yeah, think I, I threw either. a few names out there, but I don't remember who they are. And for Alvin, you need a, a tall, lanky, very young man. He was only 23 years old. And yeah. so you need a, a young man who, uh, you know, Alvin wanted nothing more in life than to be a cowboy. So you need a tall, skinny young man that uh, kind of looks like he'd like to be a cowboy. <laughs> okay we can let everyone speculate in the comments if you have any ideas um we would love to see in the comments who you would would cast for those um so i guess i just have mostly like general reading questions for you now unless anyone else has um comments questions um are you an ebook person paperback hardcover, audio book, what is your preferred reading format? I prefer to read print books. Um, I, you know, ebooks are kind of nice too. Sometimes when I'm laying in bed, and, uh, and especially when I'm traveling, I'll take my yeah. iPad with me. And when I'm in a hotel, uh, I'll read out of the ebooks. Um, uh, also when I'm traveling, and I do travel quite a bit, I like to travel. 
uh, but I always get audio books to listen to when I'm driving. I usually travel alone and go pretty good distances and and I use audio books to help me stay alert and awake on the road. They're really a great tool for that. Yeah. And I guess now is a good time to mention that um, while Blue Press is, you know, putting into into progress uh, an audiobook version of your book. So um, it, you know, that process does take a little bit of time, but, but um, everyone can look out for that in the future if you're an, an audiobook person. Otherwise, um, it's available right now in, in ebook and paperback. So that's right. And and well, Blue Plus has told me that they think the audiobook should be ready by the end of the month, but that's just a target. I don't think it's firm. Yeah, what I, well, I haven't heard a firm date yet, but um, yeah, so definitely excited for that. Um, let's see. What is your favorite children's book? I love asking people what their favorite children's book is. I just think it's very telling. Yes. Uh, well, uh, I remember you asked me that question. And I thought about that. And <laughs> one of my favorite children's books uh, when my children were quite young was Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. That was a real Classic. cute little book. Yeah. Uh, there's another book by Shel Silverstein. Uh, now the name is escaping me. Uh, he touched the leaves of the tree. The Giving Tree oh, was the that giving the name tree. of it. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great children's book too. Yeah, definitely. Um. So, what is next for you? I know you talked a little bit about possibly writing a book based on loosely based on family history. Um, do you have any other plans, relaxing, anything? Well, I'm a retired guy, so relaxing is my specialty. And <laughs> I do a lot of that. Uh, I do I do uh, hope to help promote the book uh, in the near future. Uh, I do want to have some book signings. And uh, I appreciate these opportunities like tonight to have interviews and uh, and and anybody who will stand still, I promote the book. So I printed up a <laughs> flyer that tells about my book. And uh, anybody who lets me talk to them for more than two minutes gets a copy of it. Uh, it could be uh, waiters or waitresses in restaurants, hotel clerks, gas station attendants, anybody that will stand still. I say, hey, would you like to read my book? And, uh, and uh, that's been kind of fun. <laughs> I imagine. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you have like a little elevator pitch down for it now to, you know, kind of talk about it in about two minutes or less. I do. <laughs> okay, well, um, what have you been reading lately? If you've been reading anything since your book came out? Well, right now I'm reading a book by John Grisham. Uh, uh, it's a baseball book and uh, it's different than most of his books. And I probably like his lawyer books better, but but I've enjoyed reading that. And and when I'm done with that, then I've got another John Grisham book that is a, a legal book that I'm looking forward to reading. Okay, well, we got a comment and I was hoping it was a, a final question or two for you, um, but Mary just says you're great, so. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> um, if anyone has any last minute questions, we'll take those now. Otherwise, I mean, what's next on your on your reading list? I feel like people come up with like a solid list in the summer. Do you have anything that's queued up for next? I know you said about the lawyer book by John Grisham, but yeah, after that, I I uh, I don't have anything in mind, but I'll find them. There's there's yeah. lots of good books to read out there. Yes, many there of them are published by Wild Blue Press. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's one of my biggest problems with having this job is that the more I promote the backlist books and the more new books, we just keep putting them out and I just keep adding things to my list. And, and my husband was like, you, you can't buy a, a paperback copy of every single book that you publish. And I was like, I know, but <laughs> yeah, there's always going to be more good books um, than time, I feel, so. Well, thank you very much for interviewing me and asking all these great questions. I was glad to answer them. Hope that they were helpful and that everybody enjoyed it. Yeah, 
Yeah, thank you so much for redoing this interview. Um, I feel like we had a really great conversation last week and I was kind of sad that, you know, no one got to really see it or hear it. Um, but, you know, I, this one went just as good and I'm excited to, you know, share it with everyone. I'm excited to finish the book, so. Well, it sounds like the audio problems from last week are fixed because people were able to send in their comments. So I take yeah. that to mean that they were hearing okay. Yeah. Yeah, I did a lot of test runs with my husband <laughs> to make sure that this would go okay. So yeah. um, thanks for doing that. Curious. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for taking some time and hopefully I'll get to interview you again if you, put, you know, get that book going. So yeah, I think that's all I have unless you have any last words. Nope. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And um, remember, if you commented or reacted to the live broadcast, you have a chance to win a signed paperback copy or an ebook copy. Um, otherwise, you can go pick up Patrick's book, Till Death Do Us, at wildbluepress.com. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night.